Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we take a look at the role of government in the First World War. We hear now from Professor Jerry Rubin about the Defence of the Realm regulations and other emergency legislation. My name is Professor Jerry Rubin. I am Emeritus Professor of Law at Kent University. My topic today is the Defence of the Realm regulations and the size, the scope and the structure of emergency legislation during the First World War. The legal provisions relied upon by government during the war were diverse. There were pre-1914 statutes and regulations that, in the days before war was declared, came into play. These included a series of 19th century defence acts and military lands acts authorising the War Office and the Admiralty to requisition land and property for the purposes of defence, subject to paying compensation for the taking. Also in existence were statutes such as the Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1904 and a number of aerial navigation acts which authorised the minister to impose restrictions on wireless signalling and flying, which they promptly did even before Britain had declared war. The government sought to rely on royal prerogative powers under common law, which granted the Crown, in certain circumstances, the legal authority to override private property rights where deemed necessary for the defence of the realm. Thus, the prerogative, in the right circumstances, could permit the commission of what would otherwise be a trespass on private property. The most valid prerogative power during the war was the power to requisition shipping and also to detain and seize the goods of enemy aliens. There were vast numbers of proclamations issued under the royal prerogative, such as that of August V, declaring that if any British subjects contributed to a loan to the German emperor or contracted with German government departments, they would be guilty of high treason. That was probably an illegal proclamation, since it intruded on the court's jurisdiction. A slightly different species of law was an order in council under the prerogative, for example, the one which called out reserve officers. Then, Parliament passed a large number of war-related statutes as soon as war broke out. Of course, the major statute enacted in August 1914, on August 8th, was the Defence of the Realm Act itself, DORA. This was soon followed by its amended versions on August the 28th and November the 27th. In 1915, there were enacted the Dora Amendment Act of March the 16th, affirming that civilians could not be tried by court-martial, the Amendment Number 2 Act of the same date regarding war office powers to direct factory production of munitions, and the Dora Amendment Number 3 Act of May the 19th, authorising state control of the liquor trade. The first DORA, with its minimal provisions targeting spying and the safety of communications and of railways, docks and harbours, was probably a compromise measure between the War Office and the Home Office. The legal powers needed for the military in wartime had been discussed off and on at meetings since 1885 without any firm resolution, mainly because the civilian legal advisers dismissed the need for legislation. The common law prerogative power to take whatever steps were necessary in an emergency, they insisted, would cover all contingencies in wartime. A position maintained by the Attorney General, Sir John Simon, as late as June 30th, 1914, at a meeting of the Committee of Imperial Defence. So what happened in the subsequent five weeks, I've not yet discovered, but clearly the thinness of the provisions in the first Dora of 8th of August, covering only spying, communications and certain transport facilities, suggests only a minimal concession to the military by the civilian authority and a belief that the military effort at that time would have no impact on the ordinary routines of civilian society. That, of course, 
would very quickly change. Before going into DORA in more detail, let me note the breadth of other emergency legislation passed by Parliament in those first few months of the war. If we consult the broadly named Manual of Emergency Legislation up to September 30, 1914, we'll see that it comprises over 570 pages of new legislation just in that two-month period. This includes, apart from the Defence of the Realm Acts themselves, the Aliens Restriction Act, imposing residence restrictions, the Courts Emergency Powers Act, the Trading with the Enemy Act, the Rates Proceedings for Recovery Act, the Special Constables Act, the Isle of Man War Legislation Act, the Patents, Designs and Trademarks Act and a later Amendment Act, the Intoxicating Liquor Temporary Restrictions Act, the Death Duties Killed in Action Act, you get the idea. Many statutes conferred powers on ministers or on the King and Council, that is, the Privy Council, to issue delegated legislation. Delegated legislation, such as Defence Regulation 2 on the taking over of land, would also confer power on the Minister, War Office or Admiralty to issue sub delegated legislation in the form of more specific orders, notices, directives, prohibitions. Part 1 of the First Defence Regulations, issued on August 12, 1914, conferred general powers on the military to take possession of land, buildings and other property, and to make use of them for defence purposes, and regulations to have items and persons removed from such lands, to restrict alcohol sales, to require persons not to withhold information, to enter, search and seize items, and to arrest without warrant if anyone is suspected on reasonable grounds of acting prejudicial to public safety. Trial of civilians by court-martial was possible until parliamentary uproar forced a complete change in March 1915. Part 2 of the First Defence Regulations, issued on August 12, 1914, conferred powers dealing with spying, communications and the safety of railways, etc., So, while there had been 27 substantive regulations on August 12th, by the end of the war, 261 regulations had been issued, 57 of which had been repealed at some point. Subdelegated, or even sub-sub-delegated, orders, directions, notices, authorizations were often signed off by the senior civil servant in a department, such as William Beveridge at the Ministry of Food, in regard to the onions order, rather than by the minister himself, and they might be applicable at the micro-geographical level, for example street lighting restrictions in Grimsby and Folkestone, or they might relate to specific items of food or supplies, such as prohibiting the export of molasses the supply of new regulations was incessant as the needs of the war economy unfolded. In September 1915, Supplement No. 4 of the Manual of Emergency Legislation was published and included another 450 pages of statutes, regulations and orders covering the period May 1, 1915 to August 31, 1915. September 1915 was long before the establishment of new government departments with their own regulatory regimes, such as the Ministry of Munitions, War, Transport, Blockade, Labour, Food, National Service and Reconstruction, most of which were created after Lloyd George had become Prime Minister in December 1916. Add the War Material Supplies Manual of Emergency Legislation, revised to February 28, 1918, 462 pages, or the Food Supplies Manual, or the Financial Interests Manual. And so far as I can make out, there was only minimal overlap regarding their contents. You can appreciate that it was indeed an intricate patchwork of regulation, more or less made on the hoof, and with numerous confusing legal routes to enabling the provision to see the light of day. Someone in the legal draftsman's office at the time must have known what they were doing. By November, the War Office had DORA powers to control factory production and output, and to impose restrictions on employers trying to poach workers away from government work. Many items of food, including bread, biscuits, butter, margarine, cheese, corn, grain, 
pulses, eggs, fish, fruit, sugar, glucose, molasses, confectionery, milk, tea and vegetables could no longer be exported. Feeding the nation, and not just the military, now became a concern and involved imposing restrictions on free trade. The military now had the power, derived from the Intoxicating Liquor Temporary Restrictions Act 1914, to impose restricted opening times for pubs in their districts. From time to time, the government found that its legal powers were challenged in the courts. In one case, in mid-1916, its reliance on prerogative powers to take over a private aerodrome in Sussex in December 1914 was successfully challenged in the House of Lords. Numerous defence regulations were found to be ultra vires for one reason or another, either in substantive terms or in respect of compensation provisions. Civil servants resorted to legally dodgy methods to requisition property, whether land, goods, alcohol or agricultural output. The civil servants, and I quote, bluffed with confidence, unquote, and used delaying tactics to put off the evil day when they would be legally held to account. And they were mainly successful in this ploy. How did DORA work on the ground? There have been a few studies of DORA, focusing mainly on censorship, policing, drugs, VD transmission and property requisition, which point up authority attitudes, moral posturing and resistance. We also know of the petty prosecutions for not putting that light out or for breaching the no-treating rule in pubs or for sketching at Lulworth Cove. We know that rationing rules were broken and that fines were imposed, that men and women went on strike in breach of the Munitions Acts. But how can we know the extent to which Dora was flouted without prosecution or detection? We know that hundreds of farmers objected to cultivation orders from the Board of Agriculture. How were they resolved? More information on popular attitudes to Dora is needed. Working class protests often involved direct action, such as the rent strikes that led to rent control legislation by Christmas 1915. That example suggests government responsiveness to working class domestic unrest. So perhaps Dora was more unpopular with middle-class society than with the working class. Was war emergency legislation effective? As to its economic and industrial effect, in 1984, the late Alan Millward wrote that, and I quote, the reproduction miracles during the war were in fact primarily the result of a specially created Ministry of Munitions with remarkable legal powers, unquote. He is presumably referring to the munitions of war acts, but it must be remembered that the factory controls in those statutes were first delineated in Dora and then transferred as appropriate to the munitions acts. As Millward states, the foundation for industrial success was set in law. Law here was the enabler, the facilitator, and on occasion the stick rather than the carrot. Moreover, not only was law sometimes unpredictable, certainly from mid-1916, when judges began to become less executive-minded than in the first year of the war, the law had the capacity to be reversed if circumstances permitted and demanded, and so was useful to governments as a kind of bargaining chip when assessing matters of domestic morale, for example. In respect of Dora enforcement by the authorities, whether police or otherwise, discretion would always play a role. So, leaving aside the abominable treatment meted out by the, quote, judicial warriors, unquote, of the courts to persons with German origins, I would reject a simple reductionist analysis of wartime law as an effective instrument of state control of the economy and of wartime society. Dora regulations may have been harsh on paper, but actual enforcement on the ground presents a more complex picture. In short, the surface has barely been scratched in our quest for what Punch memorably called Dame Dora. That was Professor Jerry Rubin on the Defence of the Realm regulations and other emergency legislation enacted during the First World War.
You have been listening to The British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Stuart Halifax about the role of local government in Essex, whose coastline made it vulnerable to German invasion.